Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome back to the MOOC NPTEL course on Bioengineering, an interface with Biology and Medicine. In the last lecture, we talked about some basic concepts of development. In the same theme, today we are going to continue studying about cell reprogramming, how cell can be reprogrammed. And we have tried to do some many elegant experiments in this area where people have tried to understand how cloning can be performed at animal level and you know for different type of purposes both for reproduction as well as from the therapeutic point of view. In today's discussions, in today's lecture, I will continue and talk to you about some successful experiments in the areas of induced pluripotent stem cell making as well as there are many cloning attempts which has resulted into some of the major breakthroughs in the field. Some of them have resulted into some big scientific groundbreaking research and got Nobel Prize. Some of them have also resulted into the scientific scandals and got some punishment. So let's continue discussing about cell reprogramming. All right, let's shift gear and move on to second topic, which is uh, cell reprogramming and cloning. Cloning, I think briefly we talked in the context of DNA cloning how to make multiple copies of DNA, not in great detail, but while well, I was talking to you about role of biotechnology, in which way you can make multiple copies of the genes, which could be favoring certain, uh, you know, properties that can be used for the recombinant DNA technology. I had talked to you briefly about it. Uh, let's look at some of the animal and organism cloning part. And this part looks much more kind of interesting, fancy, uh, you know, scientific fiction type of uh, idea. Uh, but before that, even cloning, also can happen in the plants uh, because plant cells have much more ability to make a totipotent cell. It means the cells have the property which uh, they can de-differentiate to any type of the cell if you just provide them right hormone and right uh, medium conditions. Let's see this experiment. This is a carrot. If you are taking the small piece of the carrot root, putting in some nutrient medium, you can see that you know the cells are dividing. And now a small embryo is developing from it. And if you put now uh, it in again some nutrient medium which contains cytokinin and gibberellic acid, etc., those hormones, now it can form the root and shoot and it can result into the full carrot. So, plant cloning, of course, you know, is, is very useful from agriculture point of view. Many times you would have seen that, you know, people have taken a small part of a given plant and may use those plants to now, you know, further grow and put in a different field, right? and they actually result into new trees or new plants. So, there are in fact some plants which uh, I don't know whether you have noticed any or not, like if the leaves even fall down from them, and if you know from the surrounding of those uh, soil area, even those leaves you know will result into certain uh, type of a, another tree. You know any example? Right, so some of the banyan tree and many of the other examples are there, which uh, do follow this kind of pattern. And cloning in, in general, plant cells are much more flexible, having much more totipotency in that way that they can uh, modify themselves and they could actually result into the full new plantlets. So, if you have not cloned a plant, of course, that is something, a small experiment to be tried out, which you can do yourself. It is not going to harm you. Uh, let's think about the animal cloning, which is much more tedious part, uh, process. Uh, many things have to be controlled for uh, a full animal to be made if you want to uh, try it out. So, nuclear transplantation is uh, one of the concept which uh, aims to look at whether similar type of plants type of concept can be used for the animal cell. Are the animal cell totipotent? Can they be converted into any type of cell which you want? Uh, so, you know, scientists have tried to do the experiments. They use some of the unfertilized eggs as well as some of the uh, fertilized eggs that they took. They try to uh, replace it with the nucleus of the uh, differentiated cells, which are, you know, much grown cells, and then try to do the experiment to test out the hypothesis, can the nuclear transplantation may happen. 
So the possibilities are from this hypothesis that if nucleus from the differentiated donor cell retains its full of the genetic information, then it should be able to direct the development and give rise to any type of tissue type. It might be very complex right now. Let's think about this hypothesis in much more schematic form. Think about experiment which was done in 1960s. Intention was to look at whether animal cells have the similar type of totipotency properties and what type of animal cell may have those properties. So John Golden, he did experiment in 1960s uh, using frog eggs. So he took the frog egg cell and did the UV radiation to remove the nucleus from this frog egg. Now what you get is enucleated or nucleus removed from the egg cell. So just pay attention to this experiment and then you will be clear about the experiments. So now you have this enucleated egg cell and you are trying to add a nucleus, you are doing the nuclear transplantation from one of the two conditions. Condition one is you are taking an early stage of the frog embryo, taking some cells from it and now you are trying to uh, you know, use this particular XL environment and use those nucleus to fuse the thing together and see can it now develop into the full embryo. That's one possibility. Second possibility they took the uh, developed cells, you know, like a skin cell or intestinal cell, not the embryonic cell, but the developed tadpole developed cells at the uh, intestine cell layer or the uh, epidermis kind of layers. And from those, they took out the nucleus now again and trying to transplant into this particular egg cell again. With this possibility, when they tried out, they, f you know, only one or two percent of them resulted into the successful embryo and it did not result into the full tadpole. Whereas with this experiment, when they use the early embryonic stage of the frog cells, then it resulted into the successful transplantation and many of them developed into the uh, tadpole larva. So it just conveyed them it is possible to uh, use the right stage of the animal cell for the nuclear transplantation to happen. And if you can use some of the early embryonic stage cell, which are less differentiated cell, then probably they can achieve the totipotency potential. So this experiment was, you know, just imagine thought and done in 1960 and with a very limited technology available with just some good hypothesis and good concepts which they tried out. Based on those, many people have started trying out many type of animal cloning, right? And let me take help of some of you to read rather than I talk about it. Okay, so uh, this cloning of frog was one of the very successful experiment being done and many people started following can we do animal cloning on different type of animals as well because frog is not something which can give you anything commercial output. Think about can you make uh, you know cloning of the uh, dogs, cloning of the cow, cloning of sheep, all of them have a lot of commercial values, right? The high breed of these animals if you can make multiple copies of them with the cloning process then probably you can have a lot of commercial values. So many people started venturing into the cloning of animals, different type of animals and then, you know, I'm not going to ask you questions about the scientist's name who did that, but just trying to show you the progression that from uh, 1960 onwards, many people have tried to do cloning of animals. And some of those are listed here, like after John B. Golden did the cloning of frog, 1986, Dr. Steen Vilatsen, they tried cloning of the uh, immature ship. 1994, they tried the cloned coughs, Dr. Neil first. And 1996, Dr. Ian Wilmot of Rosen Institute in UK, uh, he did a very successful experiment first time from the body cell, the somatic cell, they made the sheep dolly. I'm sure many of you would have heard at least, you know, uh, in one of the interesting story format about the success of dolly, right? So this is one of the success example because you are now trying to reprogram even some of the somatic body cell and trying to develop into the full uh, uh, animal from that. So reproductive cloning of mammals is something which has a lot of, you know, both uh, commercial aspects, values and limitations and ethics and of course, you know, danger of going into wrong hands and doing something wrong, right? So it is uh, much of the issue of a debate, but it is a, is a fact, it is people have now mastered the technologies and they can do these cloning processes. So scientists have shown that, you know, they could clone mammals by transplanting nuclei from the early embryonic stage. We have talked about the, the original experiment of Golden and then many people have tried in different other animals. From the early embryonic stage, you can take those uh, cells, you can transplant them and you can use them as a, uh, for the cloning purpose. 
However, it was challenging that whether the nucleus from the differentiated cell or the mature cells or the body cells, whether that could be used for the reprogramming. Because even Golden, when he showed the you know, uh, developed tadpole larva, from its intestinal epidermis, they were not able to succeed into the cloning process. So this remained still challenging that whether you can use uh, you know, the normal body cell, the somatic cells, and use those for the nuclear transplantation experiment. So that's where uh, the scientific fiction actually transformed into reality. And the scientist, Dr. Ian Wilmot of Roslyn Institute, they you know, first time claimed that they can now make the full large animal a sheep by using the somatic cells. And this experiment has a you know, lot of value because uh, they are first time able to achieve de-differentiation of these donor cells just by taking the memory cell of the sheep. And in many ways, they have mastered understanding about the cell cycle. They know that at which stage you can keep the G G1 stage controlled, where you have to make it you know, before G1, there is a GO stage, when you can you know, keep the cells in that stage in the dormancy, when you can trigger the factors for it to you know, now turn into the uh, pr proper division. All of those were so well understood that now they can play with the conditions, play with the nutrients, and then you can able to culture the memory cell and trying to use those for the cloning. Here, Dr. Ian Wilmot is shown. And uh, for your delight, I had also some interaction with Dr. Wilmot when I was at Harvard. So the experiment, what did it, uh, it happened? In this experiment, they took one of the uh, sheep uh, from which they took the memory cells. Just took the memory cell, which is you're not taking any genetic contents of it. You are just taking the, uh, not the gametes, just taking the normal uh, somatic cell, memory cell in this case. And then you took another uh, donor uh, sheep from which you are taking out the XL. So from this particular sheep, now you have to remove the nucleus out. You got the enucleated cell. And now from the memory cell, you are taking out the nucleus. You want to transplant. And for this process, people have tried many things. You know, sometimes even just an electric shock, you know, can help to facilitate the fusion of this particular cell with the nucleus. And you need many attempts, you know, people, even they have tried probably hundreds of attempts of those only one or two were successful, which resulted into this kind of cloning. So it's not, you know, so guaranteed process that it always happens. But after many attempts, they were able to succeed into some of the cell which could incorporate and grow into the early embryonic stage. Then they used third surrogate mother, not these two, but a third surrogate mother now, where they have transplanted this embryo, which resulted into the sheep dolly. So it looks like a scientific fiction, but they actually did it, and they showed first time that it is possible to do the, using somatic cell, you can do the de-differentiation and you can do the cloning. So again, you know, this just needs very basic techniques. It just does not need too much of your, you know, high gadgets and technologies. It just need, you know, understanding very well of how well you can uh, take out these nucleus from the uh, ova, how well you can culture them, how well you can control them, and then you can uh, result into the full embryo development. A question there, yes. That's right. I think that's very interesting uh, observation made. Uh, they could have used any of these two, right? They could have used any of these two to, you know, for further growth. What in this case they wanted to ensure that their cloning has actually happened and it is actually not coming dictated by any of these two. So if you're using the third mother, now then you can totally claim that all the DNA content coming from the other two is still is having potential to give rise to a new embryo. So that's what the you know, good rationale of thinking about taking a surrogate mother. But of course this could have been done in the same uh, sheep as well. So uh, whether cloning is you know, uh, such a foolproof process or is that like you know, photocopying machine where you can make the you know, photocopies of animals, you can keep producing whatever animal you like, you know, having commercial values, then you, know, you can do anything in for that matter, right? But cloned animals are not always perfect. They do not look exactly the same. And these kind of observations people have made for many of the cloned animals, including cows, including cats. Let me show you one of the interesting examples here. This cat is known as carbon copy or CC cat. It is also cloned cat. Uh, now the two, two cats ideally should exactly look same because they are cloned copies, carbon copies. But one of the cat has you know, some of the light yellowish tinge of the fur, whereas the other one has a greyish color. So whether this thing matters much or not, but 
uh, ideally you do not have the same appearance. So while their genetic content could be still same and they have been derived from the same cloning process, but they are not exactly identical, right? So that leads, you know, some possibility that irrespective of how you are overcoming the, you know, the natural laws of development process, but there might be some random events that are happening, especially, you know, X chromosome inactivation, etc., which could be leading towards, along with many environmental factors, which could be leading into different type of embryonic development for the different clones to happen. Let's look at, you know, identical human twins example. So I'm sure you'd have encountered or seen some individuals who are twins. And they look very similar, you know, they're very, very close in appearance, but they're not exactly same. And even their, you know, kind of nature-wise and their property-wise, they cannot be exactly same. So it means it's not only the genetic makeup, it's also important that in which environment they have been grown and what kind of other factors, especially epigenetic factors, which are equally important along with the genetic factors, how they influence the development process. So therefore, two individuals, even two twins or two clones, cannot be exactly identical. I think that has been one of the uh, uh, concerns as well, that you know, if you are planning to have you know, at the commercial level, at the very large scale level, how perfect your technology is. Just imagine that the, you, know, you are doing mass production of certain you know, leather or mass production of you know, various products, right? Can you do the same way of mass production for cows? Can you do the same way of mass production for uh, any of the animal which you want? Theoretically, yes, you can. But because you do, will not have success of producing everything perfect, people are not allowed to do those things at that level. So uh, there have been many observations that many of the cloned embryos, they, uh, you know, initially they look normal, but after some time, they have encountered certain type of, you know, defects. Especially to the apparent in case of Dolly, which was the example which we talked. Even Dolly died in six years' time, which is not the right age for dying for a sheep. And people may feel that, you know, probably is the time that when the DNA was taken, and is the age being counted from that DNA, because that DNA from that sheep would have already, you know, taken 20 years probably. And then are you counting now 20 plus six years? So these are the kind of questions there. So therefore, you are not starting from, you know, zero for again to, to reach that type of time life span. So Dolly early death was one of the setback for the animal uh, cloning field because then they cannot answer the, some of these kind of questions. And also many clones, they encounter a lot of abnormalities. So as I mentioned, are there certain epigenetic factors, many of the chromatin proteins which we talked a little bit when we talked about you know, histone proteins and how they are uh, involved in the chromatin uh, modeling part. So some of those are they actually being involved for the reprogramming of the donor nuclei and are they doing the chromatin restructuring which is equally important along with the genetic factors. So some of these things have been the, in the field a limitation, a thought process against that, you know, why you should not use this particular technology at the mass production level. It has good proof of concept that now we have understood the cell biology and the developmental biology so well that we can do these things, but it may not be required to attempt at that level. So that particular, uh, you know, how to identify the mechanism which are underlying for these deficiencies or these kind of aberrations are very crucial. Before we do that, we should not try to just attempt and keep making the clones, which will be all kind of having variety of issues. So as a result, people uh, were actually, you know, the cloning for the animals were banned in US and then subsequently many parts of the world. And then only thing which people felt the need for it, that can we use the cloning procedure for the therapeutic purpose? Can we take the cells, we change the cells for the requirement of what you need at that time. Let's say you need for your, you know, somebody needs for a heart failure that time or for a brain, you know, a disorder. Can you take the, these cells, embryonic stem cell, and then you can transform into the right type of cell which you want to convert and, and use the cloning concept for doing that at the cell level, not at the full organism level. So understanding the cloning for the stem cell production was actually promoted and further continued for this field. Uh, stem cell you are going to study in much more detail in the, you know, uh, once I finish my part. But in this context, briefly, uh, stem cells are those unspecialized cell which could be converted or modulated into a given specialized cell type if you provide them the right type of uh, nutrients, right type of growth factors at the very early embryonic stage level. And, you know, it just shows you here that, you know, if you can culture these in different type of culture condition, the same embryonic stem cell could be converted into liver cell 
or nerve cell or blood cell. And I'm sure you all understand and, and, and agree to it that these, uh, this concept has huge potential from the, your you know, medical uh, point of view because one could use this for you know, many deficiencies, many diseases for replenishing the cells of the same individual. Because you know, if you are taking the cell or different organ from somebody else, then you will have always that, you know, uh, the transplant tissue, the rejection. Uh, and then if you are growing the cell from the same individual and you are then transplanting back, they will have much more, uh, you know, advantages of taking it back. So how to, you know, some scientists now then, then uh, you know, plan an experiment that how to deprogram, not reprogram, but deprogram the fully differentiated human cells into the stem cells. So while one concept is you take a stem cell, you are trying to convert those into you know, specialized different type of cells. Can you take the differentiated cells and now you are trying to make them as a stem cell? And this is one of the very classical experiment, not to the great extent I'm going to talk, but just to brief you, this is one of the Nobel Prize winning uh, research done by Dr. Yamanaka, Shinya Yamanaka in Japan. When they took some of the precursor cells, made the skin fibroblast, and then actually they tried some transcription factors which are listed here, which are OCK3, 4, SOX2, MIC, and KLF4. By addition of these transcription factors, they were able to promote generation of induced pluripotent cells. And that was kind of one of the experiments which led them to win the Nobel Prize. So let me kind of take some time now and give you, uh, you know, some perspective on how our understanding about the cell, cell cycle, cell reprogramming, how it has resulted into big science, scientific prizes and some of the scientific failures and some of the scientific uh, you know, scandals. So, uh, you know, I talked to, you know, you may not recognize them. One of them is uh, Sir John Golden, which is shown here. He did the experiment of frog cloning, which we talked in 1960s, 1962. And Dr. Shinya Yamanaka in 2005 or 6, he uh, did the experiment of doing the cell reprogramming, especially stem cell experiments. And both of them, you know, in some way, looking at different type of cell reprogramming, they contributed to the basic research of how the cell can be reprogrammed. And you know, they are, both of them made original contribution, one at the level of the animal cloning level, and one at the level of the stem cell and understanding about the induced pluripotent stem cells. So both of them were kind of you know, basic research, groundbreaking research, and both of them got Nobel Prize for uh, their contribution in 2012. Next are the 2012 Nobel Prizes. The first was awarded today for groundbreaking work in reprogramming cells in the body. Ray Suarez looks at those achievements. The Nobel Assembly at Karolinska Institute has today decided to award the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine 2012 jointly to John B. Gurdon and Shinya Yamanaka the two scientists are from two different generations and celebrated today's denouncement half a world apart. But today, they were celebrated together for their research that led to a groundbreaking understanding of how cells work. Sir John Gurdon of Cambridge University was awarded for his work in 1962. He was able to use specialized cells of frogs, like skin or intestinal cells, to generate new tadpoles and show DNA could drive the formation of all cells in the body. Forty years later, Dr. Yamanaka built on that and went further. He was able to turn mature cells back into their earliest form as primitive cells. Those cells are in many ways the equivalent of embryonic stem cells because they have the potential to develop into specialized cells for heart, liver, and other organs. Dr. Yamanaka is currently working at Kyoto University Embryonic stem cells have had to be harvested from human embryos, a source of debate and considerable controversy. For Gurdon, the prize had special meaning. At a news conference in London, he recalled one school teacher's reaction to his desire to study science. It was a completely ridiculous idea because there was no hope whatever uh, of my doing science and any time spent on it um, would be a total waste of time both on my part and the part of the person having to teach him. So that terminated my, completely terminated my science at school. The men will receive their award in Stockholm in December. Additionally, there are many scientists in the world who have been attempting to do the cloning experiments and uh, many of them were successful as well. One of them shown here is Dr. Wang Wu Suk, 
from Korea, South Korea, and he made series of cloned animals. One shown is, uh, you know, along with him is uh, a dog, uh, but he made many cows which were all cloned. And you know, in Korea, people felt that you know he's going to bring lot of wealth, lot of commercial value, and probably you know so much income to the country because he has the capacity to do all this kind of cloning for their you know high yielding varieties, which can give them good good yield for food, you know different type of products. He became kind of you know one of the biggest stars in the field because he was doing series of these cloning experiment and showing one after the other they can clone many type of animals. And then uh, they were also you know attempting towards the stem cell research and showed some of their you know kind of experiment, especially one of them is known as somatic cell nuclear transfer, which was published in one of the you know big journal Science. Uh, it is first time that that has the potential to do the human uh, stem cell cloning as well. So after these research and then kind of you know they publish these works. Uh, if you are not aware in, in, in basic science field, the journal Science and Nature they are the topmost journals, which are the highest impact factor journals. Uh, so you know you have, you have a lot of difficulty in publishing these journals until unless you have a sound hypothesis and good experiments and validation done for those experiments. So they did publish in science, Dr. Uh, Wang Gusuk is the first author in this paper, along with many of these uh, authors when they are showing that somatic cell nuclear transfer is possible to be done. They also showed another paper that they could now do the cloning of the blastocyst which has potential for the human uh, type of cloning, human embryo embryonic development, and again published in science in 2004. So these two were kind of you know major breakthroughs in the field and people were already finding him as authority in the field. So as a result, uh, you know, many people started trying to replicate their experiments. And then after some time, people wrote to journal science that, you know, there are some discrepancy which we find in these experiments. We are not able to reproduce these results very well. I'm sure you cannot read it uh, from your distance here, but some of the things which I can uh, read for you. So science journal started investigation against this research and their work, and they mentioned from the information that we have so far, it seems that they have made some honest mistake. We have no evidence that there was an intent to deceive, but they still kept the research on hold. And then they you know, uh, started investigating more. But many people observed that many of the claim what they have done in the papers are actually not meeting to, to the right experimental requirements. And others are not able to reproduce those experiments. So after some time, their university started investigation and then they found series of you know allegations and series of issues which are involved in these experiments and as a result uh, you can see this news clip here this great stem cell researcher Hwang Woo Suk has been sentenced to one year and six months in prison and two years of probation for embezzling state and private funds and buying human eggs. The Supreme Court issued the verdict Thursday, which comes eight years after he admitted to faking his research. The ousted Seoul National University professor was indicted in 2006 on charges of fabricating the results of his human stem cell research and embezzling nearly two million U.S. dollars in research funds from the the government and two domestic companies, SK Group and Nongyap. Well, so there was you know rise and fall of the star. A lot of things happened from 2004 onwards. Uh, he was sentenced to jail. He again tried to make a comeback. Again tried attempting some experiment. But once people you know lose trust in you, lose confidence in you, it's very difficult to make the comeback. So he did try to show some successful experiment afterwards. But then you know there is no authority to actually accept those results. Another story developed with Dr. Haruko Obokata from Japan, and she was trying to, you know, she was a Japanese scientist like uh, Dr. Yamanaka, and she was trying to see that, you know, can she work on the stem cell part and make the process of cell reprogramming much simpler. And she came up with a concept which is known as STAP or a stimulus triggered acquisition of pluripotency, where she said that, you know, rather than using those genes or transcription factor which Dr. Sh uh, Yamanaka showed for the Nobel Prize winning uh, study, you know, you can just simply change the pH of the medium and just that pH trigger itself could actually lead to those gene changes which could acquire the pluripotency. And that was something, you know, which brought very novel uh, kind of concept. And she published this uh, work in another distinguished journal which is Nature, which you can see here and she is the first author of a stimulus triggered fate conversion of the somatic cell into pluripotency. Another paper they also published again on the same concept in uh, 2014. These are much more recent studies. Uh, 
then people started following up you know how simple this thing can be now and can we reproduce those and when they started reading their papers much more in detail they found that there are lot of issues in the images or in this particular paper uh, this lane looks like something has been taken from some other gel and brought in and put it here which is not belonging to this experiment they are looking at the dna profile here in this case they are looking at a cell under microscope and just by changing the contrast or brightness probably you could make something look like this whitish tinge uh, which is not actually accurate or by inverting the you know embryo part of the images you are making it look like this so many of these observations are made people started investigating against these that many of these things what actually has been presented looks like has been played quite a bit of the image processing side and they are not the accurate reflection of the what result one could obtain so you know with all of these issues when uh, now uh, their university started investigation again towards them and that was much more serious investigation much more recent thing and let's listen what happened here scientists from a leading japanese research institute have apologized for the grave mistakes in recent papers on a new way of creating stem cells the research was hailed as a revolutionary discovery when published in January in the British journal Nature. But mounting questions about the methodology and results forced the Diken Center to take action. NHK World's Takafumi Terui reports. Diken scientists spent about four hours in front of the cameras talking about what has become an international scientific scandal. They say the findings of their investigation into the stem cell study in question were still inconclusive. They noted they've seen no evidence of deliberate data manipulation so far. But the president of Riken, who's a Nobel laureate in chemistry, acknowledged serious mistakes were made. I would like to first and foremost express my deepest regrets that articles published in Nature by our scientists are bringing into question the credibility of the scientific community. All right, well, so, you know, when you are part of an ambitious project, sometimes you are competing for, you know, something to make a device, something to make a product, something to compete for international competitions. You're part of a team and that team is actually, you know, trying to compete with the best in the world, right? In the process, you know, sometimes you just get too greedy and then you start thinking about some fine tuning and that could lead towards some sort of fraudulence as well. And this is what has happened in these cases. And if you're part of those teams, you are equally, you know, involved. Even if you're not the one who has committed the mistake, you will be still considered part of that team and you are you have to own that particular problem yourself so in this case every author even those who have not committed the mistake even all those authors they actually you know uh, were punished they were all you know removed from job their salaries were taken some of them were sent to jail uh, this is a you know a nature journal wrote what the punishments were there for all the uh, scientists involved in the staff research uh, so every scientist was actually, you know, who was involved in the paper, even if they may not be aware that something like this fraud would have happened, it's your responsibility as a part of that team to ensure that you're also confident about that work and that research which is happening. So it's, it's very crucial to just get the, you know, when you are trying to get the glory, you have to also own the failures of that team. So, but what was the most, you know, uh, disheartening to see one of the researcher committed suicide after this particular uh, failure and this particular retractions, in the same lab, they committed suicide. And this was very, you know, uh, sad to see that the fate of the full team and what has happened to that. So if I just kind of summarize this part, although we are talking about cell reprogramming, but it's always something to learn and those lessons could be much bigger than just learning development. So cell reprogramming, we talked about some of the basic fundamental research which gave into the uh, Nobel Prizes. We also seen that, you know, some of the fall of the star which try to reach to the same level but use some sort of fraudulent uh, ways of reaching there and that was not so ap appropriate. So it just brings, you know, I think last two minutes I'll take to summarize that you need to follow some ethics in research and publication, especially in the kind of profession we all work, whether you are engineers or somebody is, you know, biologist or medical practitioner, uh, society has a lot of expectations from us and they do believe that whatever we report is actually very accurate. 
So I think your devices, your models, your analysis has to have those values, those meanings, and then only I think you know people are going to have trust in us. And as I mentioned at many times, you know, you are all going to compete for many of the competition at the world level. Please ensure that you are following the ethics in whatever work you do, and that's very crucial not only to study development but also for your day-to-day -day kind of life achievements. So today's lecture, we try to understand some of the phenomena involved in this cell reprogramming. Many elegant experiments done for the cloning, especially different type of animals were cloned, and later on. stem cell cloning was also performed we then try to take a case study an interesting story to see that how different experiments or the major breakthroughs which were reported in the studies some were based on the sound understanding resulted into the nobel prize some of them were also fraudulent research and were actually penalized and became one of the scientific scandals of the field it is important to understand that this concept of cloning is you know in one one hand it's like a scientific fiction for us which looks like uh, getting true at the same time have many ethical issues involved because when to clone why to clone and what it impact it may have for the society at the same time from the case study you would have witnessed that you know what practices one should follow in doing the scientific experiment is very crucial So let's continue some of these discussions about the science ethics involved in doing this kind of experiment and what to be reported in research and publications let's continue that in the next lecture thank you